Welcome back, everybody, to Machine Learning with Phil. I am your host, Dr. Phil. When we last touched on the OpenAI Gym, we did cue learning to teach the cart pole robot how to dance, basically, how to balance the pole. In this video, we're going to take a look at a related algorithm called Sarsa. So they're related in the sense that uh, they're both types of temporal difference learning algorithms, the difference being that uh, Sarsa is an on-policy method and cue learning is an off-policy method. Hey, appearance by the cat. Um, <laughs> if you if you don't know what that means, I highly encourage you to check out my course, Reinforcement Learning in Motion on Manning Publications. I go in-depth on all of this stuff uh, in that course. Uh, enough plugging, let's get back to it. So the other cool thing is that it, that Sarsa, as well as Q-Learning, are model-free, meaning that you do not need a complete model of your environment to actually get some learning done. And that's important because there's many cases in which you don't know the full model of the environment. What does that mean? It means you don't know the state transition probabilities. So if you're in some state S and take some action A, what is the probability you will end up in state S prime and get reward R? Those probabilities are not completely known for all problems. And so um, algorithms that, that handle that uncertainty are critical for real world applications. Another neat thing is uh, that this is a bootstrapped method, meaning that it uses estimates to generate other estimates, right? So you don't need to know too much about the system to get started. You just make some wild ass guesses and you get moving. Let's take a look at the algorithm. So uh, your first step is to initialize your learning rate alpha. Uh, and of course that's gonna control the rate of learning, how quickly you make adjustments to the Q function. Uh, then you initialize the Q function. The Q function is just the agent's estimate of its discounted future rewards starting from a given state S and taking an action A. And it may have some assumptions built in onto whether or not you follow some particular policy or not, uh, but that's a general gist. So you need to initialize your state and choose some initial action based on that state using an epsilon greedy strategy from that function Q. Then you loop over the episode, take the action, getting your reward and your new state S prime, choose an action A prime as a function of that state S prime using epsilon greedy from your Q function, and then go ahead and update the Q function according to the update rule you see on the screen, and then go ahead and store your state prime into S and your A prime into A, and loop until the episode is done. Again, in the course, I go into many more details. This is just quick and dirty, a bit of a teaser video to get you guys interested in the course and to give you some useful information at the same time. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the code. I'm not gonna be doing typing on screen, but I will be showing you the relevant code as we go along. And boom, we are back in the code editor. So here I am using Visual Studio Code. Um, even on Linux, this is a great editor. If you're not using it, I highly recommend it. Atom was a little bit buggy for me, and of course, Sublime is now is Nagware. So go ahead and give it a, uh, a look if you haven't already. So we need to define a function to take the max action. And that takes as inputs the Q function as well as the state. And you're just converting the, um, the, the Q function into an array, into a NumPy array uh, for each action in that, in that uh, list and finding the argmax of that. Now recall that in NumPy, the argmax takes the, returns the first element of a max. So if you have two actions that are tied, it'll give you the first one. So of course, in the cart pole example, our action space is just moving left and right, right? If you don't remember, it's just a, cart that slides along the x-axis, trying to keep a pole vertical. Of course, this is a continuous space, and the Q function is a discrete uh, a discrete mathematical construct, right? So the states are discrete numbers, and so you have to do a little trick here to discretize your space. And so if you look in the documentation for the cart pole example, you'll find the limits on these variables, and you can use that to create a linear space based out of it based on those limits and divide it up into 10 different buckets, right? So that way you get, you go from a continuous representation to a discrete representation of your state space. And then I define a small helper function here uh, to get the state based on the observation. It just uh, digitizes these, um, it digitizes those linear spaces using the observation that you pass in from the open AI gym. And it returns a four vector that is a uh, the buckets that correspond to the value of the element of the observation. In the main program, we want to use a small learning rate, alpha 0 0.1. For a gamma, something like 0 0.9. Of course, the gamma is the discount factor. It's debatable whether or not you need it here. So discounting in general is used when you 
don't know the we, you don't know for certain you're going to get some reward in the future, so it doesn't make sense to give it 100% weight. You could just as easily here use a 1.0 because the state transition functions in the cart pull example are deterministic as far as I'm aware. Some, if I'm wrong, please someone correct me. Uh, and of course, the epsilon for the epsilon greedy, we're going to start out at 1.0. Um, you'll see why here in a second. And so you need to construct the set of states, which of course uh, just corresponds to the integer representations of our continuous space. So you just have um, ranges from zero to uh, zero to nine, and you construct a four vector out of out of that, right? So you have zero, 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 one, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And initialize your Q function. Here I'm going to initialize everything as a zero, right? Recall that we had to, we could initialize it arbitrarily, but for the terminal states, you want that to be zero because again, the value of the terminal state is zero and A is two in the range of two because we only have two actions, move left, move right. Whoops. Uh, also, I'm gonna run 50,000 games. If you have a slower computer, you might wanna run fewer. It takes quite a bit of time to run. And I'm gonna track the total rewards as we go along. So just a little helper line here to print out the, the number of games you're playing. It's always good to know where you are, right? You if it stops chugging along, you want to know if it's broken or actually doing something useful. So you get your initial observation by resetting the environment, get your state, and calculate a random number. And so you take a, a maximum action if the random number is less than 1 minus epsilon. So epsilon is starting out at 1, so if random is less than 0, otherwise randomly sample your action space. Done flag to false, and your rewards for the episode is 0. Then you loop over the episode until you're done, and you go ahead and take the action A, getting your reward and the new observation. The uh, state prime then is going to be the um, get state of the observation, right? Because observation is a four vector of continuous numbers that we had to transform into a set of discrete integers, a four vector of discrete integers. Then we go ahead and calculate another random number and choose another action based upon that. Then calculate, uh, sum up the total rewards, and update the Q function based on the update rule I gave you in the slides. And of course, set the state in action to the new the S prime and A prime. And after each episode, you're going to decrease epsilon because you want this. To, uh, you don't want the epsilon to be uh, permanently one, right? You want to encourage some amount of exploration and some amount of exploitation. So epsilon has to be a function of time. And just save your total rewards. When it's all done, it's going to go ahead and plot it out, and you should see something similar to the following. I'm going to go ahead and run that now, and that is going to take a minute to run. And so here you have the output of the SARSA algorithm after running 50,000 iterations. So what you see is, first of all, a messy plot. Uh, that's to be expected with 50,000 games when you're plotting every single point. But what you notice immediately is that there is a general trend upward. And when epsilon reaches its minimum, epsilon goes to zero and it does a fully exploitative strategy, the algorithm actually does a really good job of hitting 200 moves most of the time. Recall that 200 moves is the... Um, 200 moves is the maximum number of steps for the cart bowl problem uh, because good algorithms can get it to, to balance uh, pretty much indefinitely, so it would never terminate. So the OpenAI gym just terminates at 200 steps, so anything close to that is pretty good. Now, one thing that's interesting is that it does have a fair amount of variability. It doesn't actually balance it 200 moves the entire time. And there are a number of reasons for this. Perhaps you can speculate below. I invite you to speculate. My thought process is that the the way we have discretized this space isn't sufficient to characterize the problem in such a way that the algorithm can learn something completely and totally useful. So it just doesn't have enough information based on the 10,000, 10 to the 4, yeah, 10,000 uh, states we've, we've, we've discretized it into. Uh, and there could be other things that matter. You know, uh, you could have other features, for instance, um, combinations of velocities and positions that matter. So we could have uh, under-engineered the problem slightly, but for just a quick little chunk of 170 lines of code or so, it's actually quite good. So uh, any questions, be sure to leave them below. And hey, if you've made it this far and you haven't subscribed, please consider. I'm going to be releasing more and more content like this. I'm doing this full-time now. Um, 
and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video. Oh, and by the way, in the next video, we're going to be taking a look at double Q learning, uh, which is yet another variation of these uh, model free bootstrap methods. See you then. Oh, and one other thing, if you want the code for this, I'll leave the code, I'll leave the link to my GitHub. Uh, this is code for my course reinforcement learning in motion. I'm just showcasing it here to show what you're going to learn in the course. So go ahead and click the link in the description and it'll take you to my GitHub where you can find that code as well as all the code from the course. Hope you like it. See you guys in the next video.